Okay, well, welcome everybody to our special session of the IMAG MSM Working Group on Multiscale Modeling for Viral Pandemics. It's our ex experiment to have a special session. We're delighted and that Dr. Rita Colwell has agreed to speak to us today. I need to remind you that the meeting is going to be recorded. Uh, it's live streamed now on YouTube, if you want to share it with your friends. Uh, and those recordings will be made available publicly thereafter. As usual, I will introduce myself, James Glazier at Indiana University, co-lead of the working group with Reinhard Labenbacher, University of Florida, and our uh, Bruce Shapiro and Jim Sluka, who are uh, work with us on this working group. I also want to remind you that we have two excellent talks coming up this afternoon. Uh, we have John Yin and Ron Milo uh, speaking on uh, the kinetics of virus growth in cells and on measuring the number and mass of SARS-CoV-2 virions in infected individuals. And that'll be at our regular 3 p.m. time. And it will be through the same link that you've used today. And I understand there was an issue because we said 3 p.m. for the link, uh, even though that link works uh, also now. And we have some interesting talks coming up. Uh, next week, we have James Moore talking about uh, biotransport mechanisms for adaptive immunity, and Denise Kirshner uh, talking about systems biology approaches to the immunobiology of tuberculosis. For this meeting, uh, we're going to have about a 40-minute talk from Dr. Colwell, uh, followed by questions. I ask people to mute and hold the questions uh, to the end if possible. Uh, we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Uh, to introduce Dr. Colwell, uh, she has a uh, resume that is so long it's almost impossible to do it justice in a short introduction. Uh, her in early studies were here in Indiana at Purdue University. Uh, she's worked extensively in the areas of global infectious diseases and water health. Of course, we all know her uh, as the 11th director of the National Science Foundation, uh, president of the AAAS, and she holds more than 63 honorary degrees and almost every major award in science and public health that you can imagine. Uh, and she's published numerous books. Her latest book is A Lab of One's Own, One Woman's Personal Journey Through Sexism in Science, which was published last year. And so without more ado, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Colwell, who will be talking to us about her uh, long-term and recent work. Well, thank you, Dr. Guizhou, for the very kind introduction. I um, am delighted to have an opportunity to start to talk to this group. Um, I hope that it will provoke some uh, discussion. I'm going to focus on um, water-related diseases, particularly cholera, um, because uh, interestingly, we are in two pandemics. We're in the seventh pandemic of cholera, uh, which is a global disease, and uh, it's an acute water-related diarrheal disease. It kills um, um, a million at least every year. The uh, seventh pandemic started in the 1960s. Uh, it occurs in about 50 countries every year with at least uh, 7 million people afflicted. Of course, COVID-19 now is reaching 30 million. So it is uh, a much more dramatic uh, pandemic. And I'll have some to some things to say about uh, how cholera information uh, can be transferred to helping us understand COVID-19. We've unfairly uh, described the Bengal Delta as the um, home of cholera, but really a hundred years ago, we had cholera in the US, in Europe, uh, Canada, as well as Asia. In fact, Washington, DC, um, had not only cholera, but yellow fever, um, malaria. Uh, it was known as the miasmic swamp because miasma uh, was what was ascribed before we knew about bacteria and viruses. Some people say it's still a miasmic swamp, but for different reasons. Anyway, cholera bacteria exist naturally <clears throat> in, the, in aquatic habitats. And that's really the discovery that my laboratory made some 20, 25 years ago now. And uh, it was not well accepted. Uh, in fact, it was quite negatively accepted because it had been assumed um, that 
um, such pathogens transfer it only person to person. But we've had some new biotypes um, in addition to the O1 serotype, <clears throat> the O139 became a pandemic um, strain about uh, a dozen years ago. So it's really unlikely we can ever eradicate cholera. We can control it, obviously, because we do that with providing safe water. Incidentally, by providing safe water, we really control about 25 other um, waterborne, usually diarrheogenic diseases. Um, the work that <clears throat> I started at the University of Washington as a graduate student uh, doing my PhD um, after getting a master's in genetics, at, at master, bachelor's and master's in genetics at Purdue, um, it was a study of marine bacteria, those that require salt. We isolated from Chesapeake Bay when I took my first job at teaching at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Um, and the, the numbers indicate the stations in the, in the Chesapeake Bay that we continue to monitor even today. Uh, we isolated Vibrio cholerae from the Chesapeake Bay about 30 years ago, and that created a big fuss. Um, again, disbelief. Um, and it was uh, con considered that this was just an anomaly that was left over somehow from uh, epidemics that had occurred 100 years ago. So we, were, um, we made the discovery that the vector for the cholera bacterium is actually the copepod. Uh, you see the bacterium and it's associated with the copepod in its gut, on its gills, um, and, it's, and um, distributed on the carapace. Um, here is the gravid female, uh, the bacteria, the vibrios, which attach to the surface of the egg sac, produce a powerful lytic enzyme, proteolytic enzyme that is probably a symbiotic relationship because the, um, the copepod casts it, its eggs into the water column, uh, and that's probably a facilitating mechanism. In addition to the fact that all vibrios produce a chitinase, it breaks down chitin, <clears throat> the N-acetylglucosamine polymer that makes up the uh, rigid structure of crustaceans, including copepods. We, we put together this very, very simple model um, based on the Chesapeake Bay work. Uh, first, uh, in the spring, uh, there's a phytoplankton bloom. Uh, these are the, the components of plankton that carry chlorophyll. They become abundant, the zooplankton feed on them. Uh, they are the animal components of the plankton. And then when the um, food source has been de diminished or depleted, um, the uh, breakup of the zooplankton releases the vibrio cholerae into the water column. And those who drink the water uh, untreated, of course, can come down with it. It's a dose-dependent disease shown by um, actually uh, physicians at the University of Maryland, but some 50 years ago before my time. And um, it was uh, demonstrated that it took about uh, a million cells per milliliter uh, in order to have a, a life-threatening uh, vibrio cholerae uh, infection. If you ingest a few cells, you might have just a case of diarrhea or uh, some vomiting, but it would not be life-threatening. Um, we were challenged that um, this, all this stuff that we had discovered, all these, uh, this new information from the Chesapeake Bay was not, we were criticized that it wasn't felt that it was relevant to Bangladesh or uh, other countries of Asia that had these outbreaks of cholera, the plankton, didn't play a role. So we were challenged. Uh, in 1975, I did my first foray, my first visit to uh, Bangladesh, and have been, I've been working there ever since, uh, except for the last year of COVID. I've traveled there two or three times a year, going to the remote villages doing research. <clears throat> and indeed, it's quite clear that the water taken for drinking, for um, washing utensils, for washing food, for cooking uh, and personal hygiene, all is done in the same pond without any treatment. Um, we found that indeed the mode of transmission <clears throat> that we had worked out for the from the Chesapeake Bay studies held quite strongly in Bangladesh, um, uh, in the villages along the Bay of Bengal. Um, the bacteria are associated really with the, um, the copepod, um, though they can be found uh, on other uh, biota, 
but strictly speaking, the copepod carries the massive numbers. Nevertheless, um, when you have very poor sanitation, person-to-person -person transmission really is powerful. And that, of course, has what has been the subject of interest for epidemiologists stu studying cholera. But in fact, the environment is really the source. <clears throat> now, I was intrigued by the fact that we were working in the Bay of Bengal in the villages along the, along the coast. <clears throat> and that there is a bimodal, that is twice a year, there's a lot of cholera in Bangladesh in the spring and fall. And this matched the plankton populations. And it occurred that since the phytoplankton can be a kind of indicator, a surrogate for the zooplankton, um, since you can't measure zooplankton directly by satellite sensing, <clears throat> we um, decided that, or at least I, I got the hypothesis, since Landsat, <clears throat> sorry about this, since uh, Landsat had been launched in, in 1985, and it had sensors that measured chlorophyll, sea surface temperature, and sea surface height, very, very crude, very primitive, compared to what we can now, um, information we can now gain from satellites. In any case, it occurred to me that we, we could be able to um, predict the outbreaks of cholera um, by uh, satellite sensing. The, I teamed up with a group at um, NASA, and we did our first um, analysis. <clears throat> it was very simple. Well, measuring, in this case, um, I'm showing the sea surface temperature, but similar charts um, we have for chlorophyll and um, sea surface height, because tide plays a role as well. And the red line are the numbers of cases in the villages along the Bay of Bengal. Uh, this was crude. It was just a mile quadrant um, <clears throat> measured by satellite for sea surface temperature, sea surface height, and chlorophyll. Um, but it was a remarkable relationship. And this was published in PNAS 20 years ago. The results were very interesting because um, improving <clears throat> the model somewhat, we were able to show that in uh, Calcutta, for every um, a milligram per cubic meter increase in chlorophyll resulted in a 33% increase in the number of cholera cases, uh, the correlation was, that is. And a millimeter per day increase in rainfall um, <clears throat> led to about a 7% increase in the number of cholera cases. And similarly, in uh, Matlab, the uh, uh, village um, that's near the um, coast of the Bay of Bengal, <clears throat> These are estimates made from um, <clears throat> the, um, the numbers of um, cases of, of cholera in those villages. We, we've since improved very much on the model in 20 years now that we've uh, done additional work. And um, we've also gone back to the data available um, in the British um, Museum in their library. Uh, they have the books. Uh, of the um, <clears throat> cases, number of cases of cholera, malaria, <clears throat> and some of the um, the um, meteorological data, you know, rainfall, etc., from 1823 to about 1940 or so, and so we transcribed the data from um, the books to the computer, and we were able to do an analysis and to show that, in fact, there's two two kinds of cholera. There's the the annual bimodal cholera along the coast. And then there's the epidemic uh, cholera that occurs every 30, 40 years in, um, in, in central India or Bangladesh. Yeah, so we were able to determine quite a bit of new in information. Now, of course, we, we use a variety of um, satellite uh, sensing uh, for data gathering, particularly some of the more recent launched satellites that allow us to monitor um, population movement. We've been um, very successful in application of the model. Um, in this case, we um, had been doing studies of a Haiti cholera epidemic, but uh, and, and the evidence that we had gotten indicated that it was more complicated than just having the UN uh, troops um, uh, carrying the 
cholera to to Haiti. In fact, it's very, in my view, it's very controversial because you know, um, a couple of years ago, a paper was published where scientists, I think from Canada, had gone had found stool samples of uh, children um, sampled in 2008, two years before the earthquake and the cholera epidemic, and isolated Vibrio cholerae. So we did a retrospective analysis. In this case, there was the Hurricane Matthew. And um, what we did was retrospectively analyze the actual um, consideration of, the, of um, uh, Haiti using our model. <clears throat> and you see the predictive model results on the left in the actual cases um, where they occurred in uh, Haiti on the right. Now, we applied this to Yemen uh, in 2015-16, the worst cholera epidemic recorded really up until that point um, has occurred in Yemen. So we did another retrospective study of the conditions uh, fitting into our model, environmental conditions. Uh, and you see the predictive model on the left and then the actual cases on the right. We published this in one of the, um, 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 uh, NASA journals, and it was picked up by Scientific American. Uh, a little squib, just a paragraph, was published, and, it, and that was read by one of our colleagues um, at the, um, um, the the British Aid Agency in London. And um, he called us in January of 2018 and asked if we could collaborate, if we could predict um, or provide a risk map in Yemen they would locate positions, water supplies, uh, medical supplies, et cetera, at those locations. And they would have a month early advance. We, we now can really predict eight weeks ahead uh, or at least provide a risk map. And so um, this worked out extremely well. And we have continued to this day. We are now have um, done about five years analysis uh, and collaboration with the British Aid Agency, UNICEF, and the UN. And uh, we provide uh, every two weeks a, a four-week prediction uh, for the risk of cholera in Yemen. Now, I want to uh, switch very briefly to another parallel uh, major study that we're doing using DNA sequencing. Uh, in, in 2007, after I finished my term of office at NSF, I decided to start a company because I had worked out a, a, um, bio, a, a, a um, bioinformatic approach um, to DNA sequencing, namely, um, it's pretty traditional now, there are many people doing it, but extracting the DNA and sequencing using um, um, any sequencer um, agnostic as to whether it's um, um, Illumina or Ion Torrent. So we've built a huge database, 160,000 curated bacteria, viruses, fungus, protists, and that is, allows us to identify everything in a sample, bacteria, viruses, protists, um, fungus, without having to do multiple analyses of 16S or 18S, but doing directly by um, Kamer uh, matching approach. Um, this allows us to identify not only the bacteria that viruses, um, protists, fungus, but also genes carried for antibiotic resistance, um, metabolism, uh, and pathogenic properties. And that gives us characterization and identification right down to strain, uh, because strain is really important. Um, if you're a physician, um, whether you have E. coli typical of the gut, well, E. coli H0157 makes a big difference. The, Latter, of course, is highly pathogenic and life-threatening. Similarly, if you're um, uh, an industrialist and you're making yogurt, you use one strain of lactobacillus casei. If you're making cheese, you'll be using another strain, a different strain of lactobacillus casei. And then if you're a winemaker, you'll be using a third strain. So a strain makes a huge difference. We've applied this to water safety. We've done a very interesting study with Orange County Water District five or six years ago when the drought hit California severely. The drinking water plant was running out of the groundwater source. And so they began using wastewater from the 
the sewage plant, the sludge was sent to sea, and the, the um, water was piped over to the drinking water plant. And the Q1 is the water sample from the um, secondary, uh, Orange County secondary uh, influent, uh, effluent um, um, plant. Yeah, of course, it's uh, screened and um, a variety of filters, crude filters, and then treated with sodium hypochloride and then filtered uh, through a microfiltration process, then a reverse osmosis, UV irradiation, subsequently chlorinated, et cetera. The end product is very safe, and we were able to show using our technique that the gray uh, area uh, is the Q1 with all of the various kinds of bacteria uh, that uh, are present. By the time it goes through the reverse osmosis uh, in the further treatment, the only bacteria left are those that you would find in just um, a, a clean, no pathogens, just clean groundwater, similarly to what you would drink from tap water today. Um, similarly with the viruses, uh, Q1 uh, has some human virus um, and uh, some agriculturally important viruses, the pepper mild motile virus, PMMOV virus. But by the time it's gone through reverse osmosis, the only bacteria, I'm sorry, the only viruses left are the uh, bacteriophages. And um, one of the concerns was antibiotic resistance, was mixing wastewater with groundwater going to transfer antibiotic resistance genes to the naturally occurring bacteria uh, in the environment. Uh, it turns out that's not the case. By the time it goes through the reverse osmosis, the only antibiotic resistance strains that we picked up predominantly were just those uh, that came in from the groundwater with antibiotic resistance. Um, for the fun of it, we've been doing a microbiome of water, and uh, I thought you might, be, you might find it interesting. We compared, we went to the supermarket and bought, bought bottled water. Um, uh, we got water from an artesian well, uh, uh, sparkling water that's very expensive, and then just drinking water tap. And, and interestingly, there is a different microbiome quite characteristic of the, the non-mineral water. The green dots are, are bottled water from the supermarket. The uh, blue dot square is the artesian well water. And uh, the triangle and the star uh, represent the uh, tap water from, uh, frankly, from Maryland, from the University of Maryland drinking water tap. Um, the bacterial species that are present are just as we have found in the Orange County situation. These are uh, typical uh, water bacteria. We did not pick up any indicator bacteria, which is reassuring. Um, and the only archaeal DNA, the only unusual bacteria came from the natural mineral water. Now, let me transfer to COVID-19. I have been showing all of this, uh, showing you all of this information about cholera, which is a bacterium. Now we uh, discuss this virus. Uh, which has uh, devastated um, populations globally. Um, we know now so much in the past year, we've learned that the um, ACE2 receptor is distributed on the lungs, the liver, the kidney, the intestines, and the heart and blood vessels. Hence, the virus attaches to and infects those uh, organs of the body, as well as the neurological system, the neural system, because we uh, now know that severe cases of COVID-19 end up some with the loss of taste and smell. Um, we learned very early on, we did this work back in February of 2020, that with our DNA technique, we could identify the SARS-CoV-2 virus and its variants, and that's been very important. Uh, what we have done is take advantage of uh, work published by others, showing that individuals shed the virus in the stool uh, these are, uh, this is a study that was published early in 2020. And then <clears throat> another study um, by a team in China, uh, again, early in 2020. Uh, this looks complicated. It isn't just read from the top to the bottom. These are 41 patients. And you read across, you see the red line is the throat swab, the nasal swab being positive, And the yellow line indicates that long after um, the, the nasal swab is negative, the stool sample will be sh uh, show uh, shed virus. 
So um, this uh, has been used, as you all now know, um, in many countries. It was first used, I think, in, in Germany and the Netherlands for detecting the virus in uh, wastewater from sewage plants. We have been doing this work uh, since last June with uh, Frederick, Maryland, and now the state of Maryland has engaged us to sample about 50 sites, uh, including uh, college dormitories, um, uh, nursing centers, and assisted living centers. Uh, so the results have been fascinating. You can see from June last year, um, some indication of a little bit of virus in Frederick, Maryland um, uh, sewage plants, but suddenly in July, there was a big spike the blue line are the end target genes that are recommended by CDC. And the orange line is an additional set of genes uh, because we were starting out last June and we wanted to make sure we were really getting the virus. And in fact, that's the case. So um, <clears throat> we were working closely with the public health department and um, allowed, uh, we, we called them and said, look, I think you need to know this. And working together, they were prepared for the, the um, out break of uh, COVID cases that occurred about four um, to five weeks later. Um, we, we've been doing um, extensive testing <clears throat> using the viral load quantitative PCR and then strain typing because we're also doing metagenomic analysis, the same type of analysis that I showed you earlier uh, using DNA and RNA sequencing. Highly controlled and allows us to be able to um, detect the variants as well of the virus, which has been very useful. Um, the, let me go back in just a minute. Um, um, the end regions <clears throat> of the nuclear capsid um, plus um, other uh, genes of the virus are part of our identification. Uh, we're able to do community profiling now of everything, bacteria, viruses, fungus, protists, which is very useful because occasionally we pick up uh, cryptosporidium, uh, crypt cryptosporidium uh, which is um, a potential um, uh, pathogen uh, and a um, forewarner of maybe some cases in the community. We've been able to show um, back um, um, Klebsiella in the Cynetobacter peaks in uh, two places in Maryland uh, using this technique. Um, and we can monitor antibiotic resistance in the community as well. Um, wastewater uh, testing allows us now to detect the early appearance as we have done now, and I think I'm allowed to speak about it. We've picked up the variants, including the British and the uh, South African um, uh, in a couple of locales in, in Maryland because we're able to detect the variants. Uh, and this is a case study <clears throat> that proved to be very, very useful. Uh, we're sampling twice a week, in this case, a dormitory <clears throat> at the um, university. 221 students uh, were tested in that dormitory that proved positive. Uh, 10 of those kids were, were positive. They were uh, quarantined and it prevented spreading across campus and also avoided having to close the campus. Now, what's interesting, and this is where I'm coming to the point where I think you all would be most interested, is that we modified the model uh, using environmental parameters for COVID-19. And we've used uh, humidity, dew point temperatures, um, some cell phone data of movement of um, individuals, and we've incorporated it into the model you see on the left, the very early prediction that we did of risk in April and May of 2020 for COVID-19, and then uh, the actual um, case map on, on the right. And then more recently, um, we've done um, um, a, a more sophisticated analysis. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, April, um, last year, sorry, I think we, I think I have one. No, I guess I didn't have the more recent. We we've got some more recent um, maps. I didn't get a chance to put it in. I'm going to close with um, um, what I would say is um, my perspective 
on uh, the application of the science that we've been doing. Um, I've, I've been describing for you very quickly and briefly um, computational modeling, DNA sequencing, nucleic acid sequencing, uh, bioinformatics. Um, but there are still people in Bangladesh getting cholera in these remote villages. And how could we help them? Well, the fact that we had shown some 20 years ago that these copepods carry the vibrios of the cholera bacteria, then we could help those families who live on boats like you see here in this slide or in those houses that you see in the distance taking water from this river. We did a, a lot of lab experiments testing different kinds of crude, inexpensive filters, men's t-shirt cloth, women's sari cloth, Chinese poplin, all available in Bangladesh to these villagers. And we were able to find that the sari cloth folded about four times, removed about 99.9% .9 of cholera vibrios in a given water sample from the ponds. And uh, we were funded by the Nursing Institute at NIH. We had applied to the NIAID, but they didn't think it was sophisticated enough and lateraled it over to Nursing Institute, which funded it, so we were delighted. And so we trained women to be extension agents to go out to the villagers, villages and teach the village women how to use the sari cloth to filter the water um, and be sure to unfold the sari cloth, rinse it, and then air dry it because the sunlight acts as a disinfectant. Um, it wasn't difficult to show them and prove to them that this was a good idea because you can see the water from the pond on the right having been filtered and on the left not filtered, unfiltered. And um, things are actually swimming there and the women easily were convicted, convinced that that would not be good for their children. We were able to reduce cholera by 50%. So this was a scientific, simple um, application uh, of the knowledge that we had gained over the 25 or 30 years that we could apply immediately to the village areas uh, in Bangladesh. Um, we went back five years after we did this study and to see if it was sustainable. We found that, that women, 75% of them, we're still using it, but in fact, even the control villages uh, villages had, had started filtering because they had learned about it. Uh, so it was hard to determine the effectiveness because everybody was filtering. We didn't have a control anymore. But what we did learn is that from the data that we gathered that we had a herd effect. In other words, if a household did not filter, if it was surrounded by households where they were filtering, it was protected. So um, lots of people involved in this at the International Center for Diarrheal Diseases Research in Dhaka, Bangladesh, particularly Dr. Manir Alam, wonderful collaborator. And then from the National Institute of Cholera and Enteric Diseases in Calcutta, Dr. Nair, um, a former student, and Dr. Raman Murthy, each of which sequentially were directors of, a, of the uh, NICED. And then a lot of students and postdocs, um, particularly my colleague, Dr. Huck, uh, who has worked with me, former student, and now he's a professor at the University of Maryland, um, working together. And then a lot of collaborators from NASA Ames, particularly Brad Lobitz, and the late Louisa Beck, and the late Brian, Byron Wood, who did the initial experiment back 20 years ago, and other students and uh, postdocs and other folks. Safe water is the challenge, and it continues to be, and I think over and above energy, this is the 21st challenge, um, 21st century challenge. Uh, we have 7 billion people uh, on the planet now, predicted to be 10 billion. And already now, there's about a billion people who have no access to safe water. Um, this is covered in my book, a chapter on cholera and a chapter on, on working at NSF and a chapter uh, when I chaired the anthrax episode. So I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you and be very happy to uh, take any any questions. I hope this is useful for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. I certainly have some, but I'll hold mine until everyone else has had a chance. Uh, John. 
Yes, I uh, fascinating talk. Um, I had a question about the um, uh, sequencing from sewer uh, water. Um, you might be aware that uh, coronaviruses can make defective viral genomes and defective interfering particles. And I wonder if you've uh, looked for um, defective genomes in the sewage. And do you have any evidence, for example, that there might be defective interfering particles of coronaviruses uh, uh, from patients? Well, well, in answer, do we have the evidence about um, interference? Not yet. We're doing um, not just um, PCR, we're doing next generation whole genome sequencing. Uh, and that I'm doing that for a couple of reasons. First of all, to determine presence of the entire virus, uh, not just uh, fragments. Um, and, and we're finding that. So, so that's good evidence, which we'll be publishing uh, shortly. But I'm also interested in... Um, the polymicrobial situation, because uh, it's a good question to, to ask, it, is there an increased incidence of other viruses, other, other pathogens, um, Salmonella or Shigella or Campylobacter or whatever. So we're in the process of analyzing those data now. I showed you a little bit where we are seeing a, an increase, uh, for example, in an, a Cinetobacter in Klebsiella in one of the towns in Eastern Shore, Maryland which is kind of interesting that at the time that there was a peak in the, uh, um, the virus. Um, so there's a lot to be learned. And, and I think the major point here in answer to your quite very good question is that this kind of analysis is really a public health tool and we should not drop it. Uh, once we have been introduced to this power of an analyzing sewage as a community health indicator, I think this should be continued. And that also, I think the satellite sensing is another very powerful public health tool, different way, but, but these are new tools for public health. And I, and I think in the new administration that a lot of money is going to be put into public health. And I think being able to utilize these tools is what's critical. So we're using the next generation sequencing because it's a, an, an, a KMER match we can determine that we are picking up 98 or 99 percent of the virus in in the, in our analysis, and so that's giving us good uh, confirmation that we are picking up whole virus. As for the specific viral genes, um, that's coming, but we haven't got there yet. Thanks very much. Great talk. Thank you. Other questions? I, maybe I'll give one, I have a couple, but I maybe one to start, which is what about the role of vaccination? The cholera vaccines were very old vaccines. I remember when I used to, as a child in Italy, getting cholera vaccines periodically. Uh, what, what was the role of vaccination, if any, in this? This, this is really fascinating and it's unanswered. Um, when we, we don't know yet, uh, if because you've been vaccinated that you don't shed. Uh, I suspect you will, but, but uh, I can't say that I have the, the data to present to you to prove that. But um, it, because the, the, the virus does attach to the intestinal lungs, uh, the cells of the intestine, uh, and, and diarrhea is one of the, the uh, symptoms, you don't necessarily have to have the respiratory uh, symptoms. You can have just the diarrheal symptoms. Um, it, it suggests that um, very likely there'll be continued shedding. And so that has to be shown. And um, <laughs> I'll tell you anyway, one of my students uh, came down with uh, COVID and he, he isn't working in the lab. He, we're all working at home. And um, he actually is, is teaching at, um, at Towson. And um, he offered to provide samples for, um, during and then post uh, the infection to, to answer that question. Um, and he's since been vaccinated. And then unfortunately, another member of his family came down, but he had started collecting samples, stool samples, uh, obviously oh. the event that one of them might come down with it. So we're in the process of analyzing those and hopefully should have some, some results pretty soon. So just, I guess following up on what you were saying, 
in, in, in terms of seeing the SARS-CoV-2 in, in the water, uh, is there evidence of spread from water, of con spread from contaminated water? That, that is a very good question. Um, um, Dr. Kim Strather um, um, at, um, at uh, University of California, San Diego, uh, has been working on aerosol transmission of uh, pathogens for a long, long time. She's a member of both the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Medicine. And uh, Kim and I have been talking and we're doing a little collaborating, but she has published some fascinating data showing that in sea spray, she's a marine scientist, well, she works, works on aerosols. Uh, Marie, she published a paper showing that marine spray from the seawater spray from an area, a beach area where there is a, a, an effluent discharge that she can detect the virus. So that was the reason some of the beaches were closed in California. Um, and then my colleague at the University of Maryland, Dr. Donald Milton, um, has been working on aerosol transmission of influenza for quite some time. In fact, he's notorious, well, he's known for his Gesundheit machine where he can capture the sneeze um, in the distribution. So, so the question is, would there be transmission in the sewage treatment plant by aerosolization? Uh, there's no data yet, or at least I haven't seen a publication. I suspect that there may be cases, but uh, because we haven't seen a reporting of a large number of cases, probably it's not a major mechanism of transmission, mainly because by the time it's aerosolized, it will have gone through much of the treatment and hence uh, less risky. It's a long answer to the short question. Yeah, that's, uh, other, other questions? I, I have one or two more if people don't have them, but there are a lot of people in the room, so I don't want to monopolize the time. Ruchira has a hand up. Ruchira, please. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Professor Colwell, for a very phenomenal talk. Uh, I was privileged to hear you speak maybe 11 or 12 years ago at UC Berkeley. So during one of the answers to the previous questions, you mentioned the new administration and public health, and I was wondering if you could speak to were, were there any effects of the previous administration on global public health? Uh, and I don't know if you have a particular insider perspective being there in Maryland or if it's the same as any, any professor or any I university think anywhere. Whatever you would have read in, in the newspapers, um, um, let me just say that there is um, a bill before Congress uh, uh, presented by um, Senator Schumer, uh, the head of the Senate, and um, the House Science Committee, um, headed by Congresswoman Bernice Johnson from Texas, has um, um, been considering the bill. And uh, we former directors of NSF that, and heads of the National Science Board have had discussions with the uh, Science Committee staff. Um, the bill is to increase the NSF budget by about $10 billion dollars um, uh, over the next five years. And the um, increase is to establish a science, a technology directorate. Um, there was a, in the Schumer bill to change the name of NSF, but we're all resisting that. Um, and so it should, I hope will remain the National Science Foundation. Um, and we are, strongly recommending that the other directorates, as well as the technology directorate, have continued substantial increase. So that's one aspect of the increase in science funding. But there is also um, a major effort for a public health um, increase. And so I think with, with luck, we'll see good science increases in the future, um, maybe in the next year or two. And I'm certainly hoping for that. Um, we certainly, the NSF budget is way too low. It's only seven or 8 billion and the NIH budget is 40 billion. And um, 
I've been complaining about that since I was director. The NSF budget should be 15 or 20 billion. So we're hoping for a good output. Thank you. Are there questions? Yeah. Um, you use the term predict in your prediction in your uh, slides. Uh, the term is kind of problematic because partially it comes from uh, statistical language, but basically what we usually do is forecast or project whatever we saw in the past. So the, the, the reason I'm asking is because uh, how good are those predictions? Like usually how long do they last? Like a month, a week ahead where you actually see that they're good enough to actually make uh, decisions upon? Where do you start disbelieving them? Ex excellent, excellent question. Uh, and and it's, it's risk. We're not predicting actual cases, we're predicting just risk. Uh, and, and forecasting is a much better term. And, and we are very, we have 60 to 70% accuracy. We, we've been having good discussions. There's a report coming out on the five years, the um, four or five years work we've been doing with the British Aid Agency and UNICEF. Uh, it's, it'll be a UN report. Uh, it's a very extensive, it's 120 pages. So it's a, it's a deep report. Um, and um, um, they have been using just rainfall. Uh, the British Meteorological Agency has been providing the rainfall as the forecast prediction of, um, of cholera. But our model is much more accurate. Um, we are able to um, forecast four weeks. We, we can forecast about eight weeks, but we provide every two weeks, we provide a, a data set and a map for Yemen for the uh, forthcoming four weeks. So every two weeks we're providing four weeks, and that's how we work with the with Yemen uh, UN team. Does, does that answer? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's good enough. Basically, you're telling that you need to update your model about two weeks, and you think that it's good enough for about four weeks. Yeah. This is approximately what I'm getting from it. And thank you for the answering. So, so I, I have one one additional question, which is that. Your, your work, you, you mentioned, for example, shedding from the gut for SARS-CoV-2. And one question then would be where the reservoirs are and the infectivity. This, this group, at I, this IMAG MSM working group is interested in all aspects of modeling, but it has a particular focus on in-host modeling. Uh, and I was going to ask you if you can identify perhaps what areas of, for example, immune response, uh, viral entry or pathogen entry or shedding reservoirs, what aspects of uh, in-host response to pathogens do you think are most in need of study or modeling? Um, I am keenly interested in the aerosol transmission. And quite honestly, I'm interested in very long distance transport. Um, I think um, the evidence is increasingly <clears throat> from six feet to 26 feet. And I think because I had done studies years ago with uh, some NOAA um, um, ship uh, board analyses where they moved from coast of Africa to the US and they were taking air samples <clears throat> that we could pick up. Of course, at the time, it was all by culture. So we were culturing fungus and some bacteria, mostly spore formers. But um, if the virus is encased in a biofilm, I suspect that it transports a very long distance. And so we're uh, now working again with Dr. Prather uh, in San Diego in It'd be, and certainly um, um, with Dr. Judra, my former postdoc at the University of Florida, with whom I think should be a member of your team. Um, it, I think 
we're in the process now of, of, of analyzing some air samples. And um, I think the respiratory um, route is the most important. And uh, Dr. Uh, Milton has some really good evidence. He's been studying um, airborne transport for a long time, five, six years, 10 years, maybe longer. And his conclusion is that this virus is as transmissible, if not more transmissible, than the measles virus. So that, that should put it in the category. And then the other aspect of it that's quite fascinating is that um, um, with, with this long-term transport, um, the original host seems to be the bats. I've been on the board for 10 years now of the um, <clears throat> uh, Eco Health Alliance, Dr. Peter Dazak's alliance. We've all been reading about Peter and his work on the WHO team. Peter has been working on bat uh, viruses. Uh, he was involved in the SARS and the MERS work. So he really knows what he's talking about. And um, uh, the coronaviridae family um, is widely present in bats. Uh, and uh, there are plenty more viruses there that we have to deal with. So we may really be dealing with COVID-20, COVID-21, 22. Um, uh, so I, I think um, the respiratory route uh, is important in the long distance trans transport. I think, I mean, one thing that fascinates me about bats is, is there's something specific about bat immune systems that pre-adapts the viruses to be pathogenic in humans. Yeah, bats yeah. have very strong interferon responses, stronger than ours, maybe a little bit less uh, adaptive immune response. They tend to persist, the viruses tend to persist. They, co they live with viruses. Right. And so these are all things that potentially could lead to, by accident, a uh, particular pathogenesis from bat-derived viruses. I'd love to talk to you more about that offline. Yeah. I was just that, that in your very first slides on cholera, you talked about dose dependence and the severity of the illness to being very heavily dependent on the initial exposure dose for cholera. And I wondered how much it's understood how that dose dependence works, because that could be an in-host modeling problem. Uh, for this kind of team? That, that's, that's a really good question because um, um, it does interfere with sodium potassium transport and it does attach to cells in the lumen of the intestine and it's the CTX um, gene functioning to produce the toxin that is involved in the infection. And so um, I think it's got to do with numbers of cells attaching to the surface and, and um, the toxin transport. But, but it's a good point. Hey, I guess, are there time for one last question uh, before we thank our speaker? I'd Reinhardt? Like, I'd like to ask John, is what John Rice is holding. Is that a lamb? John, are you there? I think it's a goat. I'm, I'm here. I'm listening. I'm loving it. Those are goats in your picture, are they not? John? There we go. Because I'm goofing off. And there was a, qu a question about your photograph. Were those are those goats in your picture? Oh, I beg your pardon. That's the hearing problem, even with the ghost captions. Yes, they are goats. They're they're my son's goats, and he lives about fifteen minutes away. And I love playing with the goats. They're just fun. Great, good. <laughs> I've, I've seen uh, dogs. Thank you. The puppies and kittens. Goats is new one. <laughs> Yeah, I I do puppies and kittens too, but the goats are a little different. <laughs> thank you for noticing. Well, I want to thank Dr. Kowal for your fascinating talk and your willingness to speak. 
as I mentioned, this will be recorded. And so uh, we'll reach a much bigger audience, I think, with the recording, I hope, because the things you're saying are critical and need to be broadcast as widely as possible. And I, I would just want to thank you again for taking the time to speak to us. And uh, uh, for the rest of us, uh, I hope to see many of you at three o'clock. Uh, thank you to our speakers for joining us twice today. And uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Colwell, for your fascinating work. With that, I'll call the meeting to a close. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.